Welcome to the Farzy Show, everybody. My name is Mark Farzetta. This is a little program it's called the Farzy Show, presented by Stephen Singer of Stephen Singer Jewelers. Dave Dombrowski just won't stop. John Middleton won't stop spoiling us. Won't stop spoiling his general manager. Won't stop spoiling his president of baseball operations. Oh no. Oh, no, 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 no. If we were his kids, sure you could have a chocolate bar for breakfast. I don't care. You want cake? Have cake. This is amazing. Literally last night. Now, Mike Sealski joins the show today. Friend of the show. Longtime friend of the show. Longtime friend of mine. Uh, he joins the show, and I had him on to simply talk about that uh, Trey Turner fella. Uh, Trey Turner uh, signing with the Phillies. And Dave Dombrowski, John Middleton, Bryce Harper, the Phillies, the Phillies fan base simply just getting their guy in Trey Turner, who I think is the number one pick of the shortstops that were available. Uh, And in that interview, I said, hey, Mike, are we done? Are the Phillies done? We taped that at 8.30 last night. We talked to little Sixers, talked to little Flyers, uh, talked to little Eagles. And then we got off the interview. I proceeded with my life. And then about an hour later, Taiwan Walker becomes a member of the Philadelphia Phillies. Yeah, that's right. Taiwan Walker of Mariners fame, of Mets fame, Braves fame. Taiwan Walker is now a member of the Philadelphia Phillies. 95 mile per hour fastball, right handed pitcher, projected to be. I doubt they would bump Suarez back after this season. So I would assume he'd be your fourth starter. And then maybe Andrew Painter, the kid, comes up to be your fifth starter. Maybe he earns that role out of spring training. If not, you go and you sign a a, a Kyle uh, a Loesch. Kyle Loesch. I did it again. Kyle Gibson type of pitcher. That is such a pull. Kyle Loesch. Good God. That's 07 Phillies. That was a waiver claim uh the waiver deadline i believe it was uh so anyway they don't even have that anymore good lord farza uh but when you look about that when you think about this this is incredible you add to your lineup and everyone's like all right let's get an arm you need an arm so they add an arm they get a starting pitcher most likely again a fourth man in your rotation behind nola wheeler suarez and then walker i mentioned 95 mile per hour fastball uh he's got a great hook uh, throws a great hook that goes in at about 80 miles per hour. Real huge 12-6 sweeping curveball type of deal. Uh, it's incredible. I should say for more description, a great break on that 12-6 to six type of curveball that he throws off the charts. Great. So then after that, you see the tweets. I need a bullpen arm. Still need a bullpen arm. So they go out and they get Matt Straw, who throws a 96-mile-per-hour rising fastball. Comes out of your bullpen, left-handed pitcher. They address that need as well. They keep checking off boxes as if they want to win. They keep spending money as if they want to win. This is bonkers. And I understand what happened in 07, 08, 09, 2010, 2011. There was some great baseball to watch. And I don't know if it reminded the ownership group that if you spend money, like they did on Ryan Howard, like they did, on Chase Utley, Jimmy Rollins, uh, Cole Hamels. If you spend money, these are all homegrown guys, so that certainly helps. If you spend money, and then you also go out and get Cliff Lee, you also go out and get Roy Roy Halladay, that's pretty damn good. Uh, This team, this city is going to be support. This city is going to be extremely supportive of their baseball team. Uh, I know attendance wasn't great this past season uh, for what it was during the championship runs, uh, during the, excuse me, I should say playoff runs, the five straight divisional titles. Uh, that's pretty incredible. That's pretty amazing. But if you show that you're going to have a consistent winner worth the price of admission, oh, baby. Uh, yeah, the city's going to come out in droves to support this baseball team. And the fact that, and this is what's so great about it, The Phillies went over to luxury tax. The ownership group, the Buck Cousins, John Middleton, they went in over to luxury tax on this season. First time it's ever happened. And this is, by the way, coming from a fan base that for many years heard about the small market mentality of the Philadelphia Phillies, even though Philadelphia is a pretty huge market. And they said, "Ah, it's not going to be us. Well, how about this? The first time ever they go over to luxury tax, they go to the World Series. If you're the Phillies ownership groups, you're John Middleton. And you're like, I don't know if I want to go over to luxury tax, but all right, I'll do this once. Let's see what happens. World Series trip. (laughs) Then um, 
Oh, and the guy you signed to a $330 million contract and Bryce Harper won his second MVP trophy. Oh, okay. All right, I don't mind spending money, even if it's stupid money. And then you go out and you get Trey Turner for $300 million. Oh, and in between, you add Nick Castellanos, you add Kyle Schwarber. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, and, and you also have uh, Zach Wheeler. This is good. This is all really good stuff. And now you got Trey Turner for $300 million. And then you add... Uh, here's our man Todd Zalecki, by the way, uh, summing it all up on the uh, the social medias here, the, the Twitterverse, if you will. Trey Turner, 11 years, 300 million. Ty Tywell Walker, four years, 72 million. And not too shabby. Uh, and Matt Straw, uh, two years, 15 million. Pff, bargain prices. They're checking the boxes, folks. I don't. I still think they're going to add little pieces here and there. Hell, Gene Segura could co still come back to the Phillies in some capacity. I would doubt that. He's still a pretty good ball player. I'm sure he'll be able to get a better deal than what the Phillies are throwing his way. Uh, but the Phillies have made major upgrades since the end of the World Series. Major upgrades. It still makes me giggle that the Phillies were in the World Series last year. I know we were all surprised by it happening, but it happened, and it's bonkers. So... The Phillies have made major upgrades across the board now. In they made it in the bullpen, they made it in the starting rotation, and they made it, of course, in the infield, in their lineup with Trey Turner. Keep being greedy. Keep being greedy throughout this entire process. And you know what? This Phillies team is going to do something special this year. Uh, they're not going to sneak up. They're not going to give us any incredible runs or anything. Excuse me, any you know uh, runs like they did last year in terms of oh they're out of it. Oh my god, no, they're back in it. Oh my god, they're the World Series. I think they're going to do something special from start to finish next year. And I think it's going to be something very much worth that price of admission. Uh, the skipper himself, because if you guys remember yesterday, I uh, threw up my lineup, and some of you guys were kind enough to comment on my lineup. Uh, Trey Turner leading off, Kyle Schwarber, Real Muto, Harper, Hoskins all the way down there. Boom, Castiano, Stott, Marsh. Mike Sealski, today's guest, almost the exact same lineup. The only difference is he has Castellanos above Boom. Just a coincidence. I didn't realize that he tweeted that. Uh, so that was just a great minds thinking alike. But uh, here's the deal. Turner, Schwarber, Real Muto, Harper, Hoskins, Boom, Castellanos, Stott, Marsh. I have Trey Turner at the top of that order. Mike Sealski has Trey Turner at the top of that order. Do you have Trey Turner at the top of that order? You're keeping Kyle Schwaber up there because our man, Philly Rob, Rob Thompson, addressed the media at the winter meetings yesterday, and he was asked that very same question. Well, what do you do with Schwaber? Will Schwaber be open to moving down in the order? And Rob Thompson's answer, first off, alluded to more moves being made. And moves that would affect the lineup, not moves that affect the rotation with Walker, for instance, or Strom, for instance. No, 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 no. Um, he talked about it in this capacity, that they could be adding other players to this lineup, other pieces to this lineup. So I don't know if that means they're going to add a first baseman. I don't know if that means Reese Hoskins will be your DH. I don't know if that means they're going to add another outfielder that could also DH. I don't know what that means. Rob Thompson could also, if you're really trying to interpret this, could also mean I'm not answering right now. <laughs> I don't have to answer that question right now, but one of the most important things was how he alluded to the idea that Kyle Schwarber will do whatever it takes to win. He liked leading off. He was comfortable leading off. He had a lot of success leading off. This is all things Rob Thompson talked about yesterday while he was addressing the media during about a 15-minute uh, interview session or media session. And all those things uh, just lead me to believe that Trey Turner is going to be a leadoff hitter when the 2023 season opens up. Folks, this lineup, we thought last year it was going to be potent, and it was pretty potent last year. This year with Trey Turner in the mix, especially after the All-Star break. Also, you saw Scott Boris, the agent for Bryce Harper, come out, say that uh, he could totally see Bryce Harper beating the timeline of the All-Star break to come back from his injury. Uh, basically looking at Bryce Harper's track record, even the last year, how he came back sooner than expected uh, from his injury last year to uh, try to help the Phillies get uh, go through September. September still ended up being a sub-500 month, uh, but he was still back by then. So, I would expect Bryce Harper to be back before the All-Star break. Maybe, like, what's that one extra week going to do type of theory? But when this lineup is in full gear, even when it's not, I mean, you're talking about missing a two-time MVP. That's a big deal. 
But when you have guys to fall back on, uh, like Trey Turner, Kyle, uh, Kyle Schwarber, JT Real Muto, <laughs> Reese Hoskins, who I know is not everyone's favorite player, but he did it himself a nice postseason with power numbers, which is nice. Alec Bohm, who had to cover off the ball yesterday, or last year, hopefully uh, he actually hits with some more pop. Castellanos, I think, has a bounce back year. Stott's figuring himself out, and Brandon Marsh as well. That was another guy that um, Rob Thompson talked about, Brandon Marsh, about how him and Kevin Long have really been on the same page since day one, and how he's got some confidence to have uh, that platoon against left-handed pitching between him and uh, Matt Verlin, or Matt Verlin, Matt Veerling, excuse me, going up against righties and lefties this season. I prefer to see uh, Brandon Marsh out there simply because he is a great fielding center fielder. And I think he did come around last year, was hitting over 300 for the Phillies for a time there since the trade over from the Angels. So I would love to see him in this lineup more, even against left-handed pitching. And Rob Thompson did acknowledge that yesterday, that because he was able to get in the cage and work with Phillies hitting coach Kevin Long, he feels like he can improve another step forward. And he was getting more comfortable against left-handed pitching. You get him as your everyday center field and you have that kind of glove, that kind of speed in center field. Yeah, that's going to be a great thing for this Phillies line. Oh, it is your nine hole hitter. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's do some damage this year, folks. Let's do some damage. And it goes beyond the lineup. Now it goes into the rotation, rotation with Taiwan Walker as one of your starting pitchers. Holy pots and pans. This is incredible. Not to mention a nice rising fastball from a left-handed pitcher coming out of the bullpen that could pop a bit at 96 miles per hour. That's a pretty nice thing, too. Are the Phillies done or you just want to keep going, baby? You want to keep adding, keep going, keep pushing, keep spending. Now, here's the other thing. This isn't like footloose and fancy free money. This isn't like, yeah, how do you solve the problem? Throw a heaping wad of cash at it and see how it goes. This is smart spending. Phillies... Needed to add another bat, needed to add speed, needed to add another, add another top-of-the-order type of guy. Trey Turner is that guy. You, you essentially could have a new leadoff hitter in this lineup, most likely will. Before, I thought my lineup was impossible. I didn't think it was going to happen. Next to impossible, I'll say. And then I heard Rob Thompson talking about it yesterday. I go, ooh, they're thinking about uh, put Trey Turner at the top of this order. This is smart spending. I know it's stupid money, quote-unquote, but it's smart spending. And one of the reasons, aside from us thinking, you know, uh, so alike uh, with our lineups, uh, Mike Sealski and I, aside from us thinking so alike, the other reason I wanted to have Mike on today was to tell the story of I want my bleeping trophy back. Because I was surprised. I tweeted out something during the playoff run about our man uh, wanting his trophy back. From 2009, when John Middleton said to Ryan Howard, I want my bleeping trophy back in 2009 after the Phillies lost to the Yankees in game six. He's at Yankee Stadium, says it to Ryan Howard. I remember that part of the story. I want my bleeping trophy back. And then I remember thinking, well, let's get this man his trophy back. Let's Because I, I I like that. I know Philadelphia needs that trophy back. I know Philadelphia would love to have that trophy back. That's a nice trophy to have. And I remember that reading that story and thinking, this that's incredible. That's the mindset that Philadelphia fan bases, whether it's the Flyers, the Sixers, it's all of us combined, four for four people, five for five with the unit. That's the mindset that we want our sports owners to have, that same mindset that we have. Like, no, win now, damn it. Like that kind of mentality. And John Middleton has that. And I was surprised when I tweeted something out about that. Some people didn't know what the hell I was talking about. And I'm like, how could you be a Philadelphia sports fan and not know this story? And if you don't know this story, and Mike will explain it, he'll give us more details on it. But the basics here with the story or this that john middleton said i want my bleeping trophy back after the phillies won or excuse me, after the phillies lost the world series to the yankees he said it in the phillies clubhouse i'll let mike give you the rest of the details but since then you know so they go in 08 they win or go to the playoffs in 07 they go to the world series in 08 and win they go to the world series in 09 and lose and then Pat Gillick steps down ruben amaro jr takes over the franchise spends money makes good signings and it doesn't come back to Philadelphia. The trophy doesn't come back to Philadelphia. They go to the NLCS, they lose. They go to the NLDS, they lose. And then we don't see them in the playoffs for uh, 11 years? 11 years. Wild to think about. Wild to think about. So now John Middleton, after the quote that was 
not off the record by any means, but certainly not part of a uh, media session. That's a line that will live in infamy in my brain. And now stupid money in an effort to back up the idea that he wants his bleeping trophy back. Now, not just with Bryce Harper, but now with this team as a whole is spending stupid money to make sure that this World Series run from this past season is no fluke. It's to make sure that this Phillies World Series run becomes the new norm. That's a quote. I know a lot of people will uh, be tossing around for quite some time. Uh, so Mike Seals will be joining us momentarily to talk about all things Phillies. Uh, Trey Turner, for instance. Also, uh, Mike is on the same page as I am. And Mike's had an article out, uh, Inquirer.com today, uh, regarding Joel Embiid. And you guys have heard me talking about this all season long. I'm kind of like, for me, basketball as a whole, like and the NBA has told you, the fan, you know what? Come check in after the Super Bowl. These guys are taking off days anyway. Yeah, just come back after the Super Bowl, and that's when our season really starts. That's kind of what they have told you with rest, load management, uh, the way these guys approach games in general. So, like, I, it's hard for me to get pissed off about anything, even at before New Year's. Like, I'll watch Joel Embiid have turnover issues, and I'll get upset about that. But I also try to keep in mind that his usage rate is, like, amongst one of the best in the NBA, excuse me, one of the highest in the NBA. So I'll go ahead and excuse some of those turnovers because he's handling the ball so damn much. Uh, the other thing uh, that I'll look at in this is uh, just how a team is getting to play together again. James Harden just came back, shot terribly from the floor. I'm not going to get that upset about that because he just came back from missing a month due to injury. You also don't have uh, one of your best players in Tyrese Maxey. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm not going to be that pissed off about what's going on right now with the 76ers. And the NBA has told you, hey, after the Super Bowl, that's when we really start things up. Christmas Day, you get excited. That's fun. People want to play on there because everybody's watching. But after that, it's like, okay, all right, now we'll take another month off and then we'll come back in you know, the beginning of February, whatever. Uh, and that's kind of how they break it down. But one of the things that Mike Sealski wrote about, it was actually just posted an hour ago, and Mike and I talked about this, was the fact that the fan base could be at their not wit's end where it's like, oh, Embiid wins or trade them. Not like that. But it's time to put the proof in the pudding. With Joel Embiid. You can look at Joel Embiid individually and say, oh my God, what a great player this guy is. This guy's amazing. And he is. And the fan base, I think, to a man, looks at Joel Embiid and goes, what a great player. One of the best in the NBA. Was robbed of at least one MVP award. Bounce out in the second round. Bounce out in the second round. Quadruple doink or not. Bounce out of the second round. Uh, bounce out of the first round in the bubble. Bounce out in the second round against the Celtics, uh, before, even before the bubble, playoff losses, no Eastern Conference Finals trips, no NBA Finals trips, obviously. Meanwhile, the Boston Celtics have knocked you out of the playoffs twice. Meanwhile, the Boston Celtics have made it to a final. Oh, and hey, here's a fun little nugget. Uh, the Boston Celtics never went through a tank to the matter of what the Sixers did, by any means. Never went through a, a process. The Milwaukee Bucks, they get Giannis Antetokounmpo. They win a championship. They didn't go through a horrid process like the 76ers did. How'd that happen? Well, it's not all Joel Embiid's fault. I'll tell you that much. How about Hinky, Colangelo, Colangelo, Sprinkle of Brett Brown, Elton Brand, Daryl Morey? Six. Guys with control of the front office in, what, a five-year span? No bueno. That's not helping anybody. Oh, and Ben Simmons uh, was a complete head case with the 76ers as well. That didn't help things either. Two of your first overall picks are no longer here in Philadelphia and Mark Kel Fultz, remember that guy? And Ben Simmons. When you think about it, other than the Sixers not even making the playoffs and like Joel Embiid, not being the crown jewel of the process, as Brett Brown used to say. Um, this has been pretty crappy. Pretty crappy. It's time for push to come to shove when it comes to the 76ers. And most people, like myself, will look at their number one player. We'll look at their leader. We'll look at their MVP, their MVP candidate, their runner-up, their second most valuable player of the last two years, Joel Embiid. 
So I think the fan base is at a point right now with JoJo and the Sixers where they look at this team and they go, we love you, Joe, especially you. We love you very much. But now it's time for push to come to show. No BS. No one gives a damn about the MVP award right now. They just want to see this team win. They need to see major progression. A second round playoff exit or earlier? Oh, forget about it. There will be a great conflagration when it comes to what happens with this fan base if this Sixers team has another disappointing exit in the playoffs, regular season, whatever it is. Uh, I think the fan base is at their, I hate to say wits end, because that makes it seem like, oh, they lose, trade and beat. Um, I know there are some people that will be clamoring for that anyway, just because they hate kind of what, they hate the fact that the uh, that Embiid stands for the process, you know? He is the process, all that stuff. But as far as I'm concerned, I'm not at that point. But it'll be a great rage <laughs> if they make another early exit. I think that's where most people are when it comes to the Sixers. Uh, Mike Sielski will talk about that uh, as well. Let me tell you about my man Steven Singer of Steven Singer Jewelers, the other corner of Bath and Water, right here in Philadelphia. Other jewelers like to mark things way up. Just to mark it down. Do you, can you guys see that? Can you guys see that paint? PJ, is that coming up? That's coming up a little bit. Yep, paint in the house. Still painting. Dadding hard. Dadding hard. Um, let me tell you, I swear I showered. Just didn't come off. Let me tell you about Stephen Singer. Stephen Singer Jewelers at the corner of Ethan Walnut, Ethan Walnut, right here in Philadelphia. At the perfect price. That's where he has his jewelry. The perfect price. Other jewelers like to mark things way up just to mark it down a couple of bucks. Make it feel like you won something. But at Stephen Singer Jewelers, there's one place, one price. The perfect price each and every day. Everybody pays the same price. There's no special discount. There's no coupon. There's no promo code. You don't have to worry about if you miss the sale. The sales every day. And you get treated like a real jewelry expert at Steve. Or you, uh, you get treated like a real family member by a real jewelry expert at Steven Singer Jewelers. Steven Singer Jewelers, one place, one price, the perfect price online at IHStevenSinger.com. That's IHStevenSinger.com. Without further ado, let's jump on the Rothman Orthopedics guest line. Talk to our friend Mike Sealski about all things really on the Philadelphia sports scene, particularly those Phillies. How about that? Right now on the Rothman Orthopedics guest line, a great friend of the show, a great guy, phenomenal writer. If you haven't read, or more importantly, I believe it's more importantly to buy the book, The Rise, The Pursuit of Immortality for Kobe Bryant, uh, Mr. Mike Sealski. Also, Inquirer, WIPs on the Glenn McDowell doing a fantastic job there as well. Mike Sealski joins the show. What's up, Mike? Mark, good to be with you, my friend. It's great to be with you. And I know I tagged you on this, but I want to go back to it because it's such a phenomenal story. A couple of months ago, the whole thing about I want my bleeping trophy back and Bryce Harper saying right when the Phillies got eliminated in the World Series, right when they lost the World Series, said, you know, we're going to add pieces, we're going to make moves and all that stuff. And I'm like, that's Bryce Harper talking. That's not the GM. That's not the president of baseball opero operations. But Bryce Harper knows he has the ear of John Middleton. And you made the story famous by putting it in the Inquirer about John Middleton after the 2009 World Series, was in the locker room, went up to Ryan Howard, told Ryan Howard he wanted his bleeping trophy back. And that story, I think, has become the, the calling card or the battle cry of John Middleton to this day. And I think he has you to thank for that. Well, he's never thanked me for it, so I'm holding that against him. Uh, <laughs> but I, I thank you for continuing to keep the story alive because it's – uh, one of the few anecdotes that can be tied to my reporting at any point in my career. <laughs> um, but but you're right, Mark. I think, uh, and my colleague Scott Lauber wrote about this in the Inquirer the other day, and it's something that I've referenced in the past as well. John Middleton is kind of becoming the Philadelphia version of George Steinbrenner. You know, the the uh, what was the, um, the character in Jurassic Park who, who creates the park and says that he, uh, yeah, John Hammond, he right, spares right, right. no expense. And that's John Middleton is, he is not sparing any expense when it comes to winning another world series. And that's why the Phillies are giving Trey Turner, uh, $300 million over 11 years. That's why they gave Bryce Harper, what, $330 million over 13 years. 
Uh, and that's why they're probably not finished in this offseason. So uh, kudos to John Middleton because I think he's he's running the Phillies like the Phillies fan he grew up being. And like I think a lot of fans of the team would run the team if they had his money. Uh, see, and I think that's what makes the story so amazing. It's that like when Chase Utley said world bleep and champions, every Phillies fan – to, to the, the to the most recent had said we you know world bleeping champion we said that as fans every Phillies fan I also think said in 2009 I want that bleeping trophy back or I want to win that championship and spare no expense and I think John Middleton kind of shared that same type of emotion with fans so if I could ask you this how did you come come were you in the locker room at the time did you overhear him say it how did that whole story come to be so I was working for the Bucks County Courier Times at the time in 2009, and it was right after game six of the 2009 World Series. The Yankees finished off the Phillies, uh, won that night, beat Pedro Martinez, and I happened to be one of the first people walking into the clubhouse, and when I entered, uh, John was kneeling in front of Ryan Howard as Ryan was sitting at his locker, and it was plain as day. I could hear him. Uh, he was there in front of the media, and it was what he said to Ryan in that moment. And in the aftermath, I was kind of surprised that nobody else wrote it, to be honest. Um, look, a lot of people were on deadline, uh, but it was right there in full view of people. And yeah, so that's kind of how it came to be. And it's it's held up for uh, a long time. I, I think you're right. You know, there are certain there are certain quotes that subsist and exist and linger in Philadelphia sports history, whether you're talking about Ricky Waters saying for who, for what. Uh, Jeffrey Lurie in the gold standard, uh, you know, Ed Snyder saying, you know, we don't need a fresh approach, things like that. And I think that Middleton line is is one of them. And I think you're right. I mean, it's it's something that's clearly on his mind even still. I was with a group of reporters talking to John uh, on the field after game five of the league championship series. And that topic came up again. Uh, and the fact that he wanted to finish the job, so to speak. And I think it's still driving him to this day. And to be honest, Mark, I think it led to some of the, it was some of the reason for the downturn that the Phillies underwent, you know, over the decade plus there, it was like, we got to win this World Series. We got to win this World Series. We're going to overpay veteran guys to try to do it. And eventually the bottom just fell out. And then they tried to rebuild and that didn't go well. And it took hiring Dave Dombrowski to get them back to where they are now. I couldn't agree more. I, my feeling was in even like 2009, 2012, 13, it was like the Phillies kept on building to win now, but they weren't good enough to win now. They kept on trying to squeeze the last drops out of the talent of Chase Utley and Jimmy Rollins and Ryan Howard until they eventually traded or let him go. So, yeah, it's unfortunate that that's the way it ended for that era with only one championship, making another World Series, obviously. But it does feel like the Phillies are certainly ready to party now, as you mentioned earlier, the acquisition of Trey Turner. And here's what amazed me. Uh, I saw your tweet with your lineup, and I swear, Mike Sealski, I swear to you, I had no idea that that was your lineup. It is almost identical. But Okay, so here's your lineup, mm -hmm. and I love it because you and I have the same thought, thought process. If you're getting Trey Turner, he's leading off for you. Schwarber, oh, yeah. you're going to have some, you're gonna have somebody on base for Kyle Schwarber. Uh, then Real Muto, I have in the same spot, Harper, Hoskins. I mean, this is almost to a T. I think I have. Castellanos and Bohm flipped. That's the, I think the okay. only difference in this lineup there. But you're alone, you're alone in the same line of thinking. For the record, here is my lineup yesterday. There you go. Uh, uh, Turner and Schwarber. Do you think it'll be tough to tell Kyle Schwarber, hey, you did a great job last year leading off, but how about batting second this time around? No, I don't think it'll be tough at all because of the caliber of player that Turner is. Uh, everybody knows that he's a top 10 player in Major League Baseball. Uh, as much as Schwarber liked leading off and as terrific as he was in that whole pretty much all season, uh, Turner is much more of a prototypical leadoff hitter. Uh, and look, you know, you could flip flop Harper and Schwarber as well and have Schwarber bat fourth if you wanted to, uh, maybe bat Harper second, because uh, if only because, you know, once he comes back from uh, the Tommy John surgery, Harper is a better, faster base runner than Schwarber is. Um, but then you make the lineup maybe a little top heavy. I don't know. But look, this is going to be kind of part of the fun of covering the Phillies this coming season is what is the lineup going to look like? What's the effect, trickle down effect going to be of Turner in the lineup? Uh, can Castellanos bounce back? Can we see a more consistent Reese Hoskins? What sort of developmental steps 
are Alex Scar sorry, are uh, Alec Bohm and Bryson Stott going to take? And Brandon Marsh continue to improve and build on what he did once he came over here from the Angels. Um, you know, the, the one hesitation I have here, Mark, um, and I think this is something that you'd be familiar with and understand. The one source of discomfort, I think, that causes Philadelphia fans more angst than anything is being a favorite. I don't think it's comfortable for Philadelphia fans to go into a season saying to themselves, we are the team to beat and having everybody acknowledge that they're the team to beat. Uh, that happened in 2002 with the Eagles. It happened 2011 with the Phillies. It happened from time to time during the Eric Lindros era. Fans have long memories here, and they prefer being the underdog or kind of coming out of nowhere to a certain degree. And that's kind of what made the 2002 run for the Phillies so so enjoyable. It was like they were good enough to kind of make that run, but you didn't really expect them to make that run, and nobody really did. And so there was kind of this unfettered giving over of yourself to that team. Uh, that's going to be, I think, a little harder maybe this coming season just because the expectations will be higher. Fair enough. Uh, I do want to switch gears here. greedy. <laughs> that's it's the only way I know. I mean, look what they yeah. did. Basically, they exchanged Gene Segura for Trey Turner. Like, that's insane. Um, Not bad. Not bad. And, and, and plus, I read a story about how Milton wants his bleeping trophy back. So, anyway. Well, there it is. <laughs> there it is. It comes back again. Um, the Flyers, I think it's showing off. They, they've won, like, uh, once each week now in the last two weeks. So, <laughs> You know, here's, here's my take on the Flyers here, Mark. Oh, yeah. I, I can understand why people are – uh, maybe a little annoyed with John Tortorella and his interactions publicly with the media and things like that. Uh, but this is exactly what the Flyers should be doing. They should be a bad team. Uh, you don't want to say tanking because you just don't want to say tanking. Right. But this is how you get good in the National Hockey League. And it's time that people with the Flyers and around the Flyers started to acknowledge this. I will give just one quick example of which I could give many. The Colorado Avalanche, you know, the shell of whom the Flyers just beat last night, five to three. That wasn't really a win over the Avalanche. That was a win over the Avalanche in name only. But anyway, they rolled to the Stanley Cup last year. OK, the reason they rolled to the Stanley Cup last year is because they had a team stacked with talent. Why did they have a team stacked with talent? Because they went through an 11 year stretch where they only made the playoffs three times and they were drafting in the top 10 a ton including getting the number one overall pick more than once. And it allowed them to get players like Nathan McKinnon and Gabriel Landeskong and, and Kale McCarr and a whole mess of guys who were key to them winning the Stanley Cup. And you can't have the sweet in the NHL, in the salary cap world, without having the sour first. And the Flyers have tried to put off the sour for way too long. It's fine that they're not good. They need to get a high draft pick. They need to hoard high draft picks and start getting high-end talent. Mm -hmm. And for the record, I was on board with everything John Tortorella has been saying, except for the you guys are asking dumb questions. That one I could have done without him. Uh, yeah, yeah with I agree. It's just it's just too Tortorella is. It's it's too it's too central casting for him. It's like it's mm -hmm. a perfect line for him, and it could have gone without it. Uh, Eagles better than I know. Everyone's already looking past the Giants. Everyone's already looking past the Bears, and it's like is it Christmas Eve yet? And it's got nothing to do with Santa coming down the chimney. It's got to do with whether or not the Philadelphia Eagles are going to be better than the Dallas Cowboys with Dak Prescott in Dallas. Right now, as it stands, before you play that game, as we sit here, are the Eagles a better football team than the Dallas Cowboys? Yes. Yes, they are. They are more <laughs> consistent. You. They have more talent up and down the, the roster. They're better. Now, it doesn't mean they'll win in Dallas on Christmas Eve, uh, but it does mean they should hold off the Cowboys and win that division, and they are a better team. Okay. Uh, last thing for you here, uh, Mike Sielski. I am getting the sense, and one of the other tweets I saw of yours the other night was on Joel Embiid. And you invoked a line from the Untouchables, basically, well, what are you prepared to do? And that was directed at Joel Embiid. And I have this crazy feeling, Mike, and I might be totally off base here, but I have this feeling that the fan base is looking at Joel Embiid right now and saying, we love you, you're great, we acknowledge you're great, we acknowledge that at least once maybe you were robbed of the MVP, but push has come to shove. It is time to deliver, whether that be an Eastern Conference Finals, whether that be a championship appearance, whether that be a parade. I get the sense right now that the Philadelphia 76ers fan is looking at this team and Joel Embiid in particular saying, yeah, it's all, oh, that's great. Deliver right now. 
Did you get an advanced column, a uh, copy of the column that I wrote that's going to appear on Inquirer.com and in the paper tomorrow? Get that's out of here. Pretty, that's pretty much what I wrote, which is to say this. Look, take that game last night against the Rockets, the double overtime loss, okay? Mm -hmm. You look at the box score of that game, and you see Embiid with 39 points. You see him 12 of 21 from the field, 14 to 17 from the line. You think, okay, he kept the Sixers in the game. In a game they should have won anyway against a team they should beat. And to a large degree, he did. But – he committed two inexcusable turnovers and fouled out in the final 92 seconds of that first overtime. And what we're talking about here, I think what you're getting, you're putting your finger on with respect to the fan base and Embiid is what I would call like the tyranny of small differences, right? Like Embiid is up there with Steph Curry and LeBron James and Giannis Antetokounmpo, but they're a little bit better because they have taken their teams to a place that he hasn't taken his through the culture that they, they cultivate and their work ethic and their willingness to go a little bit farther than it seems like MB does. Now, look, James Harden slowed that offense down to the, to like, till it was like cold maple syrup last night and the bench is inconsistent at best, but they shouldn't be 12 and 12. The Sixers should not be 12 and 12. And some of that has to come down to MB. And I think you're right. The scene in The Untouchables that you're talking about, I put this in my column. It's that perfect scene where Sean Connery and Kevin Costner are in the church and Costner wants to catch Al Capone by sticking to the, you know, he's going to use any legal means at his disposal. And Connery looks him in the eye and says, and then what are you prepared to do? And I think that's what Joel Embiid has to ask himself. Okay, you've put up all the numbers. You, you, you almost won the MVP. Everybody knows you're a great player. What next? What are you going to do now that this team can't get past that level of the second round of the playoffs? Is there something more that can be extracted from you? And are you going to deliver it? Mm -hmm. I, uh, yeah, I think that's where a lot of us are at right now when it comes to Joel Embiid and whether or not his production isn't just going to wield individual uh, trophies, but also uh, team trophies and a fine parade for the city of Philadelphia. Uh, Mike Sielski, always great catching up with you. I look forward to reading that article, inquire.com in the Inquirer tomorrow. That is Wednesday is a, that, that we could uh, actually take a gander at it as well. Make sure you guys get yourselves a copy, even if you don't like to read. Like Mike told me, he knows I don't like to read, but just buy the book. Uh, buy the book, The Rise. Uh, it's the Kobe Kobe shopping season. Come on, let's get, get out there. <laughs> I saw <laughs> another tweet I saw come across was the everybody's books. You tweeted yes. everyone's book. Yes. And I was like, this is better than any infomercial. This is, it was this Zach Berman's, it. it was Zach Berman's Underdogs. It was Ray Dinger's book. Uh, it was yours, of course, and there was one mm -hmm. more. I can't. Uh, Leslie, Leslie Van Arsel and Brian Westbrook. Oh. We're, we're all going to be at, at perfect timing, Mark. We're all going to be at Puddler's Kitchen and Tap from 6.30 to 8.30 on Wednesday night. It's in Bridgeport. Ray will be there. I'll be there. Zach, Leslie, Charlie Manuel's going to be there. We're going to be selling T-shirts and merchandise and books. Great stuff. Great beer. Come on out if you're free. That's Wednesday. That's tonight. So we're airing this Wednesday morning, so that's mm -hmm. tonight. Essentially, yep. you got look it. At that. Look at that. Check, check Mike out right there. Uh, Mike Sealski joining us right there in the Rothman Orthopedics guest line. Mike, thanks so much, brother. Thanks, Mark. It's me. Hi, I'm the oh, 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 hi. I'm sorry, I didn't see you there. Nice to see you. Uh, Mike Sealski's great, isn't he? And by the way, if you want to go see him sing Tay Tay, uh, he'll be at uh, as he's mentioned, uh, Puddler's Kitchen, three DeKalb Street, Bridgeport. Four authors and merchandise, Shibe Sports, uh, Carl's Cards. Oh, my goodness gracious. Yes, as he mentioned, Charlie Manuel will be there. Uh, it's going to be a good time. Hog is Land Press. Hog is Land Press? That's how I'll say it. Uh, great beer by Kanji Brewery. That's the Glenn Mac now. So Glenn tweeted this out, uh, and uh, Mike Sielski retweeted it. That's what I saw on his timeline. And you can check out all those great books. Right there, and get them signed by the author, and see just how nice Ray Dinger is. Why, thank you. Uh, you can see him right there, so that'll be fun. Uh, let me tell you about the great people of Manscaped and Manscaped.com, where you can get 20% off when you use promo code FARZY and free shipping at Manscaped.com when you use promo code FARZY. You'll enjoy their Platinum Package 4.0, which is their one stop shop for men's hygiene. It includes the Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, the Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer, and they come with skin safe technology that helps you reduce the risk 
of NYX. So you can manscape with confidence and comfort. Plus, the ultra premium body wash, two in one shampoo, conditioner, deodorant, crop preserver, anti chafing ball deodorant, crop reviver ball spray toner, anti chafing boxers, and the shed travel bag that you'll be using to hold the goods you'll be using to take care of your goods from Manscaped. Manscaped is a leader in below the waist grooming. Now you can trust them with the whole a shebang. Join 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by going to manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping when you use promo code FARZY. How about Freestone Farms CBD? FreestoneFarmCBD.com. Did you know they grow all their premium hemp flower in the Garden State with all organic inputs and IPM? So there's nothing, absolutely nothing, synthetic from farm to jar. And after harvest, they carefully preserve all their plant compounds with the perfect three-month cure. Just one look or smell, it's enough to let you know it's CBD done right. And their menu at freestonefarmcbd.com is something you'll absolutely have to check out. With strains like their insane tropical tasting Bayox that clocks in at a chart topping 24.1%, and Super CBD, which is half Hindu, Kush, and 21%. So next to these guys, out of the charts. So I have to give them a shot. Freestone Farm CBD, freestonefarmcbd.com. I bet the people of Mojo, available in New Jersey, must be available, must be in New Jersey to trade on Mojo. Mojo features over 300 players across the NFL of skilled positions from quarterbacks to wide receivers, from tight ends to running backs. Each player has a share price attached to them that rises and falls. Think there's a rookie about to break out? Buy low, a sell high. That's the deal right now. Anything that affects a player's stock, anything that affects the way a player could play affects their stock price and their share price on the Mojo app. So go to mojo.com for more information. Check it all out. It's incredible. Mojo, Mojo mojo.com. Must be 21 or older and present in New Jersey. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Have a PHL Sports Nation, Philadelphia Sports Nation, enhance your Philadelphia sports fan experience across all social media and blogs. That's phlsportsnation.com. You know, before we get to the chat check, I just want to throw this out because uh, I asked you guys for some moving advice. Much appreciated for all that stuff. Uh, Ari, I saw your tidbit as well. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you. Um, Have you guys ever, when you sold a house, have you guys ever brought in stagers? You guys know about this? You sell your house. Literally, people will come and, like, stage your house like it's some ginormous dollhouse and, and just make it look nice. But like one of the things that uh, has uh, certainly given my wife anxiety and me, Ajda, um, is the the stagers. And I just I didn't meet the guy, but I picture he has a beret. He's a, he wears a scarf. He has a pencil mustache. He's not French. Um, but uh, I this is that's such a high picture of because he told my wife, he, he said uh, apparently he said it was some stank on it, too. He was like, if there is any if there is any clutter in the house. We will turn around and leave. So I was like, my wife told me, and I was like, ah, that's okay. And she goes, I know that's what he said. And he was serious. I was like, clutter in our house? We have two children. There's clutter everywhere. We live in a big pile of clutter. Um, so now I got that going on. Have you guys ever had to stage? How serious were they about the clutter? Our house is pretty clean. Our house is the cleanest it's been right now. Since the day we moved, in. like I was just trying to say that, since maybe two weeks after we moved in, when we had time to unpack, organize a little bit, and then we had a kid like right away. So it was like, like literally, we were here a month before Emanuela was born, uh, before Lil Toots was born. So have you ever had your house staged? How serious are they about the whole thing uh, with uh, that whole uh, you know, no? Cl- there will be no clutter. And then he smoked a cigarette that was on a. What do you call them? Little cigarette holders things? Those little extenders? So you're not holding the cigarette itself? So your fingers don't smell like cigarette? Anyway, um, that's how my mind works. Sorry, folks. Uh, but yeah, you ever had your house staged? Love to know. Hit me up in the comments if you, you have had your house staged. Uh, so yeah, there you go. Uh, Let's get into the chat check. See how you beautiful people are doing on this fine morning. Melly, what's up, Melly? Cat 60. Is it March yet? Cat 60, you and I are on the same page. Uh, Kevin, good morning, Kevin. Kevin, good morning again. Mally, Kevin, John, John Cheeseboro. Good morning. Nice to see you guys. Nice to see you guys. Uh, Sean Gillespie, 
Morning, Mally, Kevin, Cat, and Cheese. I can only assume you are referencing old school. I hope you are, unless you're just saying cheese. But that's what I'm. That's how my mind inter- interprets che- cheese. Didn't we put you in a dumpster? I got out. Anyway, uh, Kevin, good morning. Crap Card Hub. Crap Card Hub. Love the name. I'm convinced Middleton and Dave owns a money printing machine. Oh, Dave. Wait, oh, Dave Dombrowski. Okay. I was thinking of the Buck brother or Buck cousins, I believe. Uh, it's it's certainly possible. Philly's got that championship hunger. W- want the whole meal. Mm-mm. Sean, absolutely. Mally, what's going on? Now we can finally go find a first baseman. Please, Dave. I haven't even looked at the first baseman that would be available right now because I think it's so out of the realm. But with with Rob Thompson talking about how they could be adding more pieces to the lineup, he's either buying time so he doesn't have to answer anything about why why where Kyle Schwarber is batting, or they're legit not done, and they're going to keep adding to this lineup. Not just get another arm, not just get another bullpen arm or a rotation arm if they think Andrew Painter is not getting it done in, in his tryout in spring training. But they're going to get another bat to this lineup, whether that's going to be a guy that could be a DH, whether that's going to be a guy that could play first base and Reese Hoskins DHs. I don't know, but I don't think they're done. I think there'll be another, I think there'll be a name similar to Taiwan Walker's addition to this team. So I don't think it's going to be a Carlos Rodon uh, 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 added to this rotation. I think it's going to be a name out there that will be go, oh, really? Okay. Not like, who the hell is that guy? You know what I mean? So that's the way I look at it. Uh, how about Matt Str- Strom signing and bringing his hair with him? You pair him with Brandon Marsh. The Phillies are halfway to the 1980s. Rock band like Guns N' Roses. Love it. Mike Fuji. Mike Fuji, welcome back. Nice to see you. Happy hump day to you as well. John Cheeseborough, I'm putting Trey Turner at the top of the order because Schwarber should be protecting Harper. Ooh. I I had a similar thought, and I thought that might be too much for people to wrap their head around. I, I'm, I'm not doing it, but I like the idea of Harper getting more fastballs. Love that idea. Um, so, John, I'm not necessarily – I'm not not on the same page with you. I just don't think it's – Nearly as likely as Trey Turner actually leading off and Kyle Schwaber batting second or fourth. I mean, I love to see his bat in the cleanup spot. Um, I just don't know if they're going to take that step. Uh, Melly, hello again. John Cheeseborough, hello, John. Uh, I don't need Castellanos already down 0 2 while he's walking, while he's on the on deck circle. Uh, true. Melly, hello. John, hello. Jeff, hello again. A playwright named Titus Platius said you have to spend money to make money. These moves will pay huge dividends in the next 10 years. I hope so. Uh, definitely make that money. Absolutely. Fuji, hello again. Mihai. What's up, Mihai? Morning, Mark. Everyone, ring the bell. By the way, my Spotify wrapped for 2022. Don't get more Phillies than this. Dancing on my own. My number two song, number one, Flower by Moby. Harper's at bat walk up music. April, what's going on? Charles Adderley, good morning from paradise. Good morning from paradise. Charles Adderley. Uh, it is, um, it's raining in Philadelphia, but enjoy Nassau. Uh, jealous much? Uh, Mihai Sanchez. Oh, wait. Bry- uh, Bryson Stotts walk up was your number four? Or number three, okay. Uh, love 22 NL champs. Yeah, damn right. Sean, hello. April, I love seeing the Phillies being aggressive for... I love seeing the Phillies be aggressive for too long. They just let everyone else get the new talent and just relied on older players. You know what? I was thinking about this yesterday, um, just going through some older lineups. The name that jumped out to me, two names. One was uh, Wilson Ramos. Uh, I believe it was a deadline acquisition by Matt Klintak. And I thought, oh, my God, they got a catch. This is before Real Muto, obviously. Oh, my God, they got a catcher, a guy they can hit. They got the, what do they call him, the polar bear? Oh, my God. Yeah, this guy's great. They get him. They also got as Drupal Cabrera, as Drupal Cabrera. Um, 
and he was having a good year. And I thought, oh my God, this is great. The Phillies are definitely gonna they're gonna definitely gonna make the postseason. This is unreal. And they did not make the postseason. They missed out on the postseason. It was not, it's not good. It was no bueno. Um, those two names came to mind yesterday, and then that also made me go down and leave more of a rabbit hole. Carlos Santana. Carlos professional hitter, Carlos Santana. I remember he was like not gonna cover off the ball with the Indians. Phillies got him for a year. He sucked. And I'm, I don't, uh, that's even nice. To, he sucked. Went back to Cleveland and had another great year. It's like bonkers. Uh, but all those names uh, came floating across my brain. Uh, to all our Temple grads in the chat, I made my return to the campus last night for the, for the game of St. Joe's. Don't worry. Maxie's is doing fine. I went and checked on her. Thanks, PJ. You're a good man. Good man. I would, I, you know what? I don't have many regrets in life. I really don't. Uh, but one is that, you know, I worked too hard in college. I didn't get to enjoy too much. Every once in a while, oh, I'd, I'd hit a rager. I'd hit a rager. Um, but I, I rarely partied at Maxi's. Rarely. There was something about being at school and drinking that just seemed, I felt like my professor was going to come in and be like, you know, that's due or something like that. And I'm like, what? One of those things. Because I was always in a huge uh, fear of, uh, of like, I wake up one morning and because I was always a huge procrastinator. And if you ever, if you're familiar with Brian Regan, the comedian, he does a great bit on, um, it's a cup of dirt. You didn't know your science project was due. It's a cup of dirt. And it's like your head shoots off the pillow and you think to yourself, oh, shoot, that was due today. <laughs> what is it, Brian? It's a cup of dirt. All right. You failed. Uh, so there you go. Uh, thanks, everybody, in the chat. You guys are great. Oh, the pizza's still phenomenal at Maxie's. I've had, a, I've had the pizza at Maxie's. It is delicious. Uh, thanks, everybody, in the chat. You guys are great. Much appreciated. Anybody else got any moving, uh, staging your house, uh, anything like that? Please help. Please help. Uh, let's all uh, move on to, oh, wait, before I get to, no, that is in the morning rush. What am I doing? Uh, thanks everybody in the chat. You guys are great. Let's get to the morning rush brought to you by Sky Motor Cars, skymotorcars.com. Farzetta, you big dumb idiot. Thanks to the, uh, amazing job. Thanks to the amazing job by our man, uh, PJ. He was able to edit me not being able to find clips for, um, Mike Sealski because, you know, his Twitter account and all that stuff. But, uh, yeah, I did the same thing. I didn't load this, and here it is now. I was able to pull it up that fast. Alex Coffey of Inquire.com. Uh, Tywell Walker posted this to his Instagram 20 minutes ago. Now, this was last night, of course. And it is him listening to Dreams and Nightmares by Meek Mill. Oh, my goodness gracious. Also, the theme song of the 2017 Philadelphia Eagles uh, Super Bowl run. How about that? Now, you guys didn't think I'd go a whole show without talking more about the Philadelphia Eagles, did you? <laughs> uh, here's what I got out of their press conferences yesterday because the coordinators addressed the media. Mike Clay, special teams coordinator, was able to spike the football a little bit, talking about how the return game was a little bit better, how special teams was a little bit better. A lot better. Okay, fine. So that was nice. Good for him. Nice to see that. Hopefully they keep that going. Britton Kobe, keep that coming. Very nice to see you. Awesome. Keep that going. Um... Jonathan Gannon gave a lot of credit to James Bradbury and Darius Slay for their diversity, their versatility, and how they were able to present their coverages uh, in his, not scheme, but philosophy. Uh, and he also talked about how this defensive line was able to get home, talked about schemes and just about everything else as well. Also talked about how uh, versatile Saquon Barkley is. He presents a lot, uh, a much different challenge not uh, better or worse, but very much different than what Derrick Henry presents because of just how versatile a player he is. So they'll have to be on the ready for that. And then the other thing that I took away from the press conference yesterday, aside from Mike Clay, the uh, special teams coordinator, aside from Jonathan Gannon, their defensive coordinator, was Shane Steichen talking about how good the offensive line was and how good they picked up the blitz for Jalen Hurts' touchdown pass to A.J. Brown that he just flipped his hands out at the last second to bring that touchdown in. That was pretty incredible. But Shane Steichen also gave another testimonial for how hard a worker Jalen Hurts is. A lot of times people talk about a guy's work ethic 
And when you feel like you have something to prove, you feel like you have to get on the same level as everybody else and you hear about that work ethic, you're like, all right, good, good for him. He's doing what it, what it, doing what it matters. But Jalen Hurts is on top of his game right now. Jalen Hurts, as far as I'm concerned, is the front runner for the MVP award in the NFL. Shane Steichen talked about yesterday what went into that buildup. What do the kids call it now? The glow up. All right. And he talked about the hard work from Jalen Hurts. And, and this sounds like it's such a cliche, but this is what he said. He said that Jalen Hurts is the first in the building, last out of the building. He's always at the Novacare complex. He's always working on his game. He is a student of the game. I'm going to be honest. A lot of times when I hear that kind of talk about a, a young player, I give the most epic eye roll you, I could possibly give. Epic eye roll. But when you see the improvement from a year ago to now because of the hard work, because of the hours put in, I sit on the edge of my seat and I go, okay, oh, tell me more. And Shane Steichen went off yesterday on how hard Jalen Hurts works how hard he studies. It's not just him out there on the football field slinging it, working on his accuracy, working on his conditioning, working on his agility, working on his playbook out there. It's him in the classroom. It's him in the meeting rooms. It's him in the film room putting in that work to make sure that he knows everything he needs to know about what that team is doing that's going to be across the field from him. And when he faces the Giants, Shane Steichen talked about this as well when talking about his offensive line and pass protection and all that. The Giants blitz almost more than anybody in the NFL. Wink Martindale, go figure, has an aggressive defense. He has a defensive scheme that I know a lot of Philadelphia Eagles fans would love. But at the same time, I think uh, Wink Martindale would also love to have some of the defensive linemen of the Philadelphia Eagles fans get to a joy now every Sunday. I think the Eagles win this game. I know Daniel Jones, uh, was it Blue City? It must have been Blue Blue City Empire Sports pointed out yesterday. He's 4-2. and two. I didn't get a chance to fact check that. I know he's got a winning record against the Eagles. I still don't give a damn. <laughs> I just don't respect any team quarterback by Daniel Jones. Duke, to steal my man uh, Colin Coward's line from yesterday. Uh, that's how you could best describe uh, Daniel Jones. Duke. The guy I do respect more than anybody is Saquon Barkley. Epic talent. Uh, now you talk about that defense one more time to go back to the point. Uh, one thing the Eagles are going to have to be very much aware of is where the blitzers coming from, how many blitzers are coming, whether it's going to be an edge rusher, whether they're going to have a quarterback spy, whether or not they're going to have a, some kind of count on that QB spy just to go after Jalen Hurts, try to rush something. But again, the bottom line is this, when you have a quarterback as versatile as Jalen Hurts, Hey, defense, good luck to you. You want to try to rush him? He's going to escape that pocket. You want to try to almost have like a, a bracket in the backfield there, try to have outside contain at all times with Jalen Hurts, run up the middle on you. And if you take two guys out of coverage, he's good enough to pick you apart. Speaking of cliches, that's where we're at right there. Uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening, everybody. Much appreciated. Oh, Ray, Ray just chimed in. Scott would be, Scott would be a good number two hitter. Uh, he gets good at bats and gets his bat on the ball so he doesn't strike out. I think Stott has that potential to be a number two hitter, but I got to see it. I got to see it before I just throw him into that spot. So I'm going with more of the proven guys up top. Here it is one more time. More of the proven guys up top uh, before I uh, start moving Stott up that lineup. Stott did have a one hell of a second half to the season, um, but uh, I'm, I'm not there yet, but I think he can definitely earn that in the upcoming season. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. My name is Mark Farzetta. This is the Fire Z Show. Presented by Steven Singer of Steven Singer Jewelers. Jim Hyden, fresh off an appearance at Maxi's, where Temple beat LaSalle by 10 points last night. No big deal. Um, fresh off an appearance at Maxi's and a fine job producing the program. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. This is the Farzad Show presented by Steven Singer of Steven Singer Jewelers. My name is Mark Farzad. Have a great rest of your day. Talk to you soon. Bye.